Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for this special bonus episode of Live from the Trevor Zoo. It's great to welcome you all to the zoo. I'm Charlotte Meggs from Millbrook's class of 2019. Currently, I'm a college student at Scripps College, double majoring in art and biology. Last week, I showed you how I carve on emu eggs to create these unique etchings of our zoo animals. This week, I'm going to show you how I paint on our Rhea eggs. Just a reminder, please feel free to ask questions throughout today's episode. Just type them in the comments and we'll answer them toward the end of the show. So when I was a student here, I noticed that we also had another large egg resource that wasn't really being utilized, and that was from another one of our ratites, our rheas. A ratite is a bird that has a flat breastbone without a keel, so it's unable to fly. They include ostrich, cassowary, kiwi, and the ones we have here, emu and rhea. Interestingly, with emus and rheas, the females lay the eggs, and then they are basically done. The males then do all of the sitting on the eggs, and once the eggs hatch, they do all the rearing of the chicks. This is somewhat unique in the animal world, as it usually is the females that do the rearing, or often with bird species, both the males and females take turns raising their young. Ratite usually begin to reproduce between two and three years of age. However, some birds lay as early as 18 months. Average egg production is about 40 to 60 eggs per year for ostriches and 20 to 50 eggs for emus and rheas. The egg is about the same size as the emu eggs, but since the shell is white, carving into it doesn't create any contrast, so any engraved drawings really don't show up. However, it does make a great surface to paint on, and that's just what I did. As Beryl Roberts, class of 2010, had started carving animals on the emu eggs, I started painting pictures of animals on the Rhea eggs, like this one of Billy, the baby black and white lemur. And that's something which I have now developed and continue to do here for the zoo. So let's have a look of what it's like to paint on one of the Rhea eggs. So here we are back in the studio. Um, I have a Rhea egg here and some paint, so I am going to start working on painting one of these eggs. Um, and my usual process with this usually starts with going through the Trevor Zoo Instagram um, and pulling up different photos on there um, to see if I can find one that I think would be a particularly good painting on an egg. Uh, and from there, I will send the photo over to my computer where I have a larger version of it pulled up on my screen so that I can draw it from there. I usually start by sketching out in pencil on the egg, whatever I'm going to draw. In this case, I've gone with a photo of Barry, one of the red pandas. So my pencil outlines usually start out fairly rough, um, but I try to get as much of a perspective as I can um, so that I can then follow the lines when I'm painting. Um, the red pandas are always some of my favorites to paint um, because they're some of my favorite animals. Um, and Barry is extra special to me because I've worked so much with her, especially in my research project. Um, I've known her since my freshman year of high school. She was one of the first red pandas I met here. Um, and I remember being incredibly excited my sophomore year the first time she walked up to me when I came in to bring her her food. Um, and I still have somewhere on my phone a photo of where I'd typed out how excited I was um, that I'd come in with the food and she'd come running up to come get it. I also really like painting because a lot of these animals have really pretty colors that can be hard to capture. Um, in just the engraving style of the emu eggs. And so I really like being able to actually incorporate some of that. Um, acrylic paint was sort of one of the first art mediums that I really did a lot of. And I actually, when I came here, I expected to go into more painting 
um, and have that be the main art that I did. Um, and by chance and my schedule not working out, I ended up in ceramics, which is how I got into that and ended up doing that almost all of the time. Um, but I still love painting, and so this was a great way for me to be able to continue doing that, um, even while I had classes more focused on ceramics. Eggs are always an interesting medium for pencil because if you mess up, you can sort of wipe it off um, rather than using the eraser. Um, though, on the other hand, the eraser is also not as effective, so you kind of need to wipe it off. Probably one of my favorite animals in the zoo is Cyril the red panda, um, who I actually just went and hung out with for a little bit. And he is just the sweetest animal, and he is incredibly old. He is actually just under a month older than I am, um, which is amazing. Um, and that he's lived so far beyond a red panda's life expectancy. Um, it's really incredible, and he's still just the sweetest little guy and always is interested in saying hi, always is happy to get a craisin as a treat, um, and he loves hanging out with people. So at this point, I've sort of decided one side of my drawing is slightly weirdly proportioned. Um, so I'll go back in and move it slightly. As you can see, erasers don't work quite as well on eggs as they do on paper. Um, with the Rhea eggs, I initially wanted to do something with them um, because they we have really boxes and boxes of them, and we were at least doing something with the emu eggs that we had lots of, um, but we've really had just these enormous boxes of Rhea eggs up on a shelf in the classroom, and we were doing nothing with them. Um, my first plan was to try carving into them, um, which really didn't work because there's no contrast. Um, and when that didn't work, I tried carving into them by drilling all the way through. Um, but that was incredibly difficult to get any details and really didn't work very well um, because you could only do silhouettes. So at this point, I think I have my sketch about done um, and I'm going to go in with the painting. Um, I usually use, go like to do sort of the biggest colors first, um, especially white because I want to get down sort of a base color on here because the problem with eggs is that they don't soak up paint the way a canvas would. I'm also going to get some black because those are probably two of the main colors and I will mix a, correct, the, a red of the correct shade once I get to more of the details. So you can kind of see on here how the paint doesn't distribute entirely the way it would on a normal canvas. Um, there's a little bit of tendency for it to not be fully opaque. You can kind of see here. Um, so you really have to lay the paint on much thicker than you would in a normal situation, or you can just do multiple coats. Um, I like to do sort of a combination depending on what the area is. Um, I will do either thinner and more coats um, or much thicker coats. Um, so like in the ears where I want some texture, I will generally go with a slightly thicker layer of paint um, because I can do that because it's all one air color. But in her face here, I'll go with a, a thinner layer just to lay that base down because I'm going to need to come in with a light orange color in the future for this face mask that they have. The full version of this could also double as a Bob Ross tutorial. Red Panda version. Barry is also interesting because her mask is a lot lighter than some other pandas. 
Um, they have a fair amount of variation in the exact color of their facial markings and things like that. Um, but Barry definitely has a much more white mask um, and her, the orange in her face is much lighter. One fun fact is that there are actually two different subspecies of red pandas, um, which many people don't really know. I did not know until I started doing a research project on them. Um, we have the Ilurus fulgens fulgens subspecies, um, which typically have sort of a lighter mask um, and less intense and brown facial markings. Um, whereas the other um, subspecies, which is Ilurus fulgens cyani or Ilurus fulgens refulgens, depends on which era of naming you go with, since they've been through several different scientific names. Um, and those guys have a slightly darker, more intensely red-black markings in their mask. One nice thing about the sort of weird texture of a egg is that before getting to the stage of putting a clear coat over it, um, if you get a smudge of paint in the wrong place, you can actually just scratch it off with your fingernail um, because the acrylic paint just forms sort of a layer on top of the egg. This is also the reason why we put a clear coat on all of the eggs, because if we didn't have them, um, after buying it, you could just take your finger and scratch off the design, which would be really unfortunate. I've made these eggs for really quite a lot of different people. Um, one of the most memorable ones was when I made them for Dan Ash, who is the president of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, Ricardo Stanos, who works at the Smithsonian, um, and D Thomas Lovejoy, who is actually an alum of Millbrook um, and has done all sorts of incredible conservation work um, and currently is at George Mason, Mason University. Um, and I made eggs for each of them. Um, this was actually really quite early on into the development of the, these Rhea eggs, um, but I made Thomas Lovejoy a golden lion tamarind egg because of his work in golden lion tamarinds. Um, and Dan Ash got an emu egg um, with the AZA logo and the Trevor Zoo logo, um, and Ricardo Stanos got one with a painting of a red panda on it because that was the first, we got our first red panda from the Smithsonian Zoo. And I actually film, I actually painted those at this exact table that we are filming this at. And the egg I made for Dan Ash, I ended up having to make two of because the problem with eggs is that they are round and we have these lovely things to put the eggs on, which come in very handy. But when you have many eggs, sometimes you don't put them on the in the correct place. And the first egg that I made for Dan Ash rolled off of the table and smashed. Um, so I somewhat last minute remade an, a new emu egg for him, um, and it was all good. But I was definitely a little bit upset. All right, so that's enough of the white for now. Um, I'm going to go in with the black and then we are going to switch over to doing the details. And as you can see here, the black is a much easier color to apply than the white. It's much more opaque. In college, I'm currently studying art and biology and Really, a lot of that is incredibly informed by my time at Millbrook and at the Trevor Zoo in particular. Um, as I sort of talked about earlier, um, my experience at the zoo really made a huge difference in affirming what I'm interested in studying 
and just taught me so much about how to deal with different things in life and was a huge part of why I'm interested in the career I'm interested in. Um, and while I've always loved animals, it was definitely a really affirming experience to do all of this and learn so much about conservation in the real world and what can actually be done. So I'm getting into some slight shading here, um, just on her chest where it meets her head. Um, there are some, there's some light in her fur, and so I'm trying to start mixing it because her fur is not completely pure black. I've definitely gotten faster and more used to doing these eggs over the time. Uh, the first Rhea egg I did was much more of just an experiment to see whether this was something I could do, and I probably painted and redid that egg about five times before I had a version that I was satisfied with as a prototype egg that I could go into and the sort of idea of actually making these to sell in the mill. I've always been a bit of a perfectionist with my paintings, and so I, that was definitely a process of me trying to figure out how to make my paintings good enough for myself that I was a lot, that I felt that they were something I was okay with selling to other people because I didn't want to sell anything that I didn't think was good enough. So I'm actually going to wait to add the black details to her face um, since those are going to be the most intense parts um, and I don't want them to mess anything up. Um, they will come sort of right towards the end. And I really don't need very much paint for each one of these. Um, they, this is even probably more than I necessarily need. The most paint goes into sort of the process of mixing them and uh, getting the right color for each section. Luckily at this point I've done enough red panda paintings to have a fairly good idea of the color mix that goes into most parts of them. Um, they a lot of their body is a sort of mix of red and black, and the tiniest bit of yellow um, is sort of enough of a mix to get the right color. Um, but different parts of them have all, all these different shades of red and orange, so it's definitely important to experiment and try and figure out what the correct color is. And also different lightings will make their fur appear very different and that's always an important factor in as well. I sort of joke sometimes that half the time I spend painting I spend just mixing colors to get the right color, but it's kind of true. And so I usually do the first bit of this paint slightly on the messier side because I know I'm going to come back through with like more of this white paint and clean up these edges where, for example, the red meets her mask, her white mask, um, because I want to have the white fur look like it's overlapping the red fur because that's how it looks in real life. Um, and so because of that, you sort of have to put down paint and then layer more paint and then layer more paint. I tend to like working with a really small brush, even on the slightly larger areas of her face. Um, that's sort of just a personal preference thing. Um, I tend to make pretty small paintings, um, which is one reason why eggs are fairly well suited for the art that I make, um, because they are, in fact, quite small. Um, but I like doing a lot of tiny details and things like that to try and get as much realism as I can. Um, they're definitely some of my art classes in college are pushing me to sort of expand beyond that realism that's where I've mostly had my basis in. 
some parts of their fur will also have a little bit of white mixed in, um, particularly if the light is on it. Um, and so that's what I'm doing here, is there's this little bit of the fur on her back that's showing and that's in the light. These guys are so beautiful, it's no wonder they're one of our most popular animals. Um, they're definitely one of the animals that caught my attention first when I came to the zoo um, because I actually visited early on right when we first had the baby red pandas. Um, that was when I was in the process of applying to Millbrook and I just fell in love with these little baby pandas because they were so sweet. So I'm going back in with a little bit of black paint here um, to sort of blend the, the black and the red together where they meet. Because um, she sort of has a little bit of red that's under her face, um, but mostly it goes into black. I'm gonna bring in a little bit of light here. This is one place where I can do this sort of scratching away. Um, it just works. You can just Also, if you're really interested in what I'm doing here, um, you can both buy plain emu eggs and rhea eggs at the mill, I believe, um, and you also can paint on regular chicken eggs and things like that. Hollowing them out is definitely a process to do, um, particularly since smaller birds' eggs um, have a lot thinner a shell. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend carving into them with a Dremel um, like I do with the emu eggs, but they are very pretty and you can still make them even with chicken eggs and things like that that are a little bit easier to get hold of. Now I'm going to make some orange and try to start in on her mask um, where she gets some orange. I would love to make a joke here about red pandas already wearing masks so they're protected from COVID but I'm not sure what exactly I'd say. Um, and since Barry has such a light mask we're going to use quite a lot of white here. Um, it doesn't have to be perfectly mixed in orange and white like light orange because you want a little bit of streakiness to it um, because the fur on her face is quite clearly a mix of orange and white hairs rather than just all light orange hairs. So I'm going to lay this area down and then probably go back and forth over it with more white and more orange several times. And this is where it really helps to have laid down the white the first time as our first step. Um, because it makes much more of an easy way to have the orange be visible because um, otherwise the orange would form sort of streaky lines on the egg um, and we would have much hard, a much harder time sort of controlling the orange um, from sliding around to get, to get these really precise lines. Red pandas have these super cute little eyebrow marks that are also white, so we're going to make sure that those are visible as well. That's another thing that I sometimes go back in and touch up at the end, um, because if you get the shape wrong, it can really change how the face looks. We also want to put in, she has these two really cute little sort of V marks almost at the top of her nose. Um, they're still a fairly light orange, um, but they are slightly darker than most of the rest of her face. Um, so I'm going to make sure that those are in there. Gives her nose this sort of cute little pointed look to the top of it. I've been sort of waiting for some of these to dry so that rather than blending in, um, they will allow me to be, do more sort of streaks with the white um, 
because one problem that I often run into is that if I lay down the orange and then immediately go in with the white, it just blends instead of putting in more detailed texture. I've also done some trying to pass on my um, my egg painting to other students. Um, so we also have some eggs available by Mary Zhang, um, who has done a wonderful job. She and I have very different art styles, so that's so it's really cool um, because you can sort of very much tell the difference between. Um, her eggs and my eggs um, from our art styles. Um, and I'm hoping this will be a continuing thing, just as the, re the emu eggs have been, um, because it's a really fun project. Luckily, though, well, the emu eggs I have a much harder time doing from home, um, since I don't have the full Dremel set up as easily. Um, I would need to find a space that I don't mind getting covered in emu dust um, or do it outside, which I can do during the summer. Um, the Rhea eggs, I can take home a box of emu eggs and work on them in my bedroom. And then whenever I come back to visit the zoo, I bring some, emu, some Rhea eggs with me. Um, for the mill. Red pandas also have, often have some slight little orange underneath their eyes, not quite as intense as the little blob I've just put there, so I'm toning it down now. Um, but they, if you look really closely at photographs of them, they have this little bit of orange under their eyes as well, um, in addition to on the rest of their face. I've definitely gotten to know the features of a red panda very well since I started painting them. Now we're going to go back in with the white and touch up some of her cheeks here. Try and get some of the areas here to show that white overlapping the red um, on the sides of her face. I'm actually going to come back in on these little face markings on the sides of either side of her nose. Um, also to make it so that the fur here lays on top of the white more. Um, and then I will go in on the white on her nose so that the fur there lays on top of it. Because um, if you look at, closely at a red panda's face, um, their fur sort of all goes back from their nose um, and overlaps in this pattern. With all of this, I'm sort of constantly checking at, looking at my reference image, checking whether I think this looks like Barry, and sort of trying to evaluate where I think I can shift it slightly to make it look more the way I want. Painting's definitely an interesting process because a lot of the time that you spend is evaluating sort of how you can change something to make it look right. And most of the time when something looks wrong, it's pretty difficult to say for certain why it looks wrong. I actually may switch over to a different brush at this point. Basically the same brush, but just one without any other paint on it. Um, because this brush has so much pink in it um, from doing the dark reds. And especially as I get into the last details, I want to be able to have good control over where colors go. Red pandas are also sort of interesting to me because they're incredibly cute, but when you look closely at them, they actually don't have a lot of the sort of typical they don't have like the particularly large eyes that is sort of the classic cute animal feature. So it's definitely interesting that they're such an icon of cuteness, really. Um, Barry, who I'm painting here, can definitely be very sassy sometimes. So when I would come in to feed her um, and clean her enclosure, 
if her diet wasn't ready yet, and so I just came in to feed her before going to get her diet. Um, she would often come up to the door right as I came in and look at me and wait for me to put a diet down. And if I didn't, she would sort of turn around and walk away in a huff, um, clearly very displeased with me for not having brought her her food. I also really got to know her and Ju very well during, and Hope as well, during my research project because I was going into the panda exhibit every day um, to collect fecal samples for a hormone assay, um, which is maybe a slightly gross job, but I came in every day to collect those fecal samples and also to feed Ju craisins soaked in green food coloring. And the goal of this was actually to turn his poop green so that I could tell it apart from Hope's poop. The idea being that I would be able to get the correct fecal samples to detect the hormones in because at the time I was trying to tell if she was pregnant. I started putting the black in her ears, which always looks a little bit strange until I put more white in it. Overall, most of this painting process is just a matter of going back and forth and patience as you try to figure out what needs to be changed, what needs to be done to make it look the way you want it to. Um, and that's a lot of art for me, is just having patience um, and not just giving up until I'm satisfied with it. Her fur is also not perfectly white, so I'm adding a little bit of shadow in here, particularly on her chin. Um, it's definitely in shadow. Um, and I want to show that. Next, we're going to go in and try to do her mouth um, and nose. Their noses are always fun to do because they're really just little blobs. Um, but they do have a fairly distinct sort of fading upwards on their nose, um, which I'm going to get to in a second. Um, but for right, I'm leaving it for right now so that I can get the rest of the nose to serve a darker shade. Um, but they have sort of the actual nose itself and then above their nose there's an area where the fur is thinner and it sort of forms a continuation of their nose that goes up. In this part it's especially important for the brush to be as fine as possible. Um, because I want her little mouth not to be too big. And often, as I'm doing now, I will look at this and decide that it's actually not quite in the right spot. <laughs> um, normally, I can make these mistakes not on camera. Um, I can just sort of mess one part up and go back and redo it and come it back on. But this time you guys get to all see the process and see how I also make mistakes sometimes. Um, so I'm going to cover this up with some white paint. I'll go back in later once it's drier and make it so that it's less gray because right now the paint is still slightly wet. So as I cover it up, it forms sort of gray paint, um, which is not what I'm going for. And while I wait for that to dry, I am going to try to work on her eyes, which I could do as just dots of black, of black paint, but I'm going to use a tiny bit of brown because Barry does have lovely dark brown eyes. Red panda eyes are always a little bit difficult because they're so small. Um, there's really not very much space, at least if you're doing a portrait on the size of an egg. Um, there's really not that much space, but that looks about right. And I'm going to do the other one, and then I will come in with the brown. 
Um, and in the photo, it's visible that she also has this sort of slight reflection at the tops of her eyes. So I'm going to mix a little bit of gray um, and extremely, extremely carefully um, attempt to put this gray on just this top little bit of her eyes. And this is where you really need a steady hand, which I try to have, but with varying degrees of success. I think I'd like it a little bit lighter than that. And this eye has a little bit of extra light in it because of the angle of the sun in the photo. So I'm going to just put a little dot. So now that we've got those eyes finished, her nose and mouth still really looks quite strange. Um, so we're going to come back in with some more white paint um, and fix this up. It's almost dry. Um, areas will need touch-ups. I'm going to scratch a little bit away here. Um, it's a little bit of a funny thing to be able to just scrape away paint that you don't want. Um, that's definitely not how paint usually goes, but <laughs> so what I realized was that her mouth in this photo is really much closer to the bottom of her chin than I initially had drawn it. Um, so I'm just trying to put it in the right spot um, and with it, put her nose in the right spot. And this is the problem because it's very difficult to get a fine enough line. Um, one of the things I really like about acrylic paint, fortunately, is that you can just, if you mess up, you can just go over it with more paint and make it look like the mistake didn't happen. Uh, really all of this is a process of messing up different things and hoping that they work and if they don't work, going in and revising and attempting to make things right, make them work. I actually discovered Millbrook because of the zoo in large part. Um, I went to a fair that had a lot of different high schools at it. Um, did not think I was going to go to a boarding school for high school. Um, my parents were definitely not super interested in the idea. Um, and came across Millbrook's little booth there. Um, and their biggest selling advertising point was, we have a zoo, um, which naturally got my attention immediately um, since I've always loved animals, always sort of wanted to do more work with them. And I always had that as sort of one of the things that I thought I might do with my life. Um, and I told my parents about it and promptly got an absolutely no way. You're not going to boarding school just because it has a zoo. Um, but I ended up doing a lot more research and visiting the school and managed to convince my parents that it was okay for me to leave home and go to a boarding school. And the zoo's definitely been sort of the place with a lot of my best memories from high school are all tied to the zoo and either at it or related to it or with opportunities that I had because of it. Um, and it's just been an incredible thing to get to do. Um, it'll be something that I'll have and look back on for the rest of my life and hopefully I'll be able to continue to visit the zoo for the rest of my life. Now we're going to get into the math. 
forgot why I hated doing the mouths, but it's definitely one of the hardest parts. I have a hard time with people mouths too. Um, but animal mouths are definitely especially difficult, particularly when they're not fully visible. Um, you have to sort of rely on using things like shadows to suggest the presence of a mouth. Um, and in this case, there's somewhat of a visible mouth, but her mouth, clearly in the photo, you can tell that it extends beyond where it is just this one little dot of darkness in the photo. Um, but there isn't a visible line there. Um, it's just your brain filling in from the shadows in the photo that, oh, there's a continued separation there. Um, and so when you're painting, you have to make sure to find a way to suggest that separation um, without it having it be too dramatic or too obvious, because if you make it too dramatic, then it won't look like the actual animal. Bob Ross, but make it zoo. Just kidding, I can't live up to Bob Ross. And this is really, like I said, with having to go back and forth, this is one of those instances. I'm putting black down and then going back in with some white to make it slightly smaller. Now I've decided I need a little bit more gray below her nose, so I'm putting that in. I'm really trying to make the, to the tip of my paintbrush stays relatively sharp um, because that will allow me to direct the paint better. Um, we have an almost finished egg. Here is the finished egg with a clear coat applied. I also add a layer of varnish in order to protect the paint from scratching off and to make the surface look more evenly shiny. Rhea eggs typically take me between 40 minutes to two hours. It really depends on how complicated the painting is and any mistakes I have to fix. This one took me about an hour and 20 minutes. I've continued to paint Rhea eggs and carve emu eggs when I have a chance to come back to the zoo ever since I graduated, and they are available for sale at the mill. Emu eggs are $29.95 and Rhea eggs are $39.95. The gift shop currently opens every day at 9 a.m., so stop by the zoo if you are interested in purchasing one. Since I graduated, some other students have also shown interest in painting and carving eggs, so the tradition lives on. Okay, so let's hear your questions and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. If you have any questions about our rias or emus or their eggs or anything else at the zoo or Millbrook School, just go ahead and ask in the comments here. All right, so Connie asks, is the egg naturally that color or did you paint it prior to doing the red panda? Um, and the answer is that yes, the egg is naturally this color. Um, these are the Rhea and Emu eggs, naturally colored. Um, so this is them basically fresh and without any altering. The only thing that's been done to these two is that they have been hollowed out. Um, but otherwise, this is just sort of naturally what it looks like, um, and there's this really interesting contrast between them. Um, she also wants to know, have I painted any of the red wolves on the Rhea eggs? And the answer is yes, I have. Um, I currently don't think we have any in stock at the mill right now, um, although I think we do have a red wolf on an emu egg. Um, but I will put that on my list because I'm always trying to brainstorm what to paint next and try to figure out what we have currently in our collection um, and what I need to make more of. Uh, Desa asks, where did I start learning to paint? Um, I sort of started mostly on my own in around middle school was when I got sort of really serious about doing art um, and interested. And I did a lot of sort of 
mostly learning on my own from YouTube and things like that and just sort of practicing over and over and over. Um, I did take a semester of art here at Millbrook, a, a semester of painting here at Millbrook. I took many semesters of ceramics and other art. Um, and I have done a short program at a local um, art school that does a that that offers a summer program um but other than that I've most it's mostly been just sort of practicing on my own and she also wants to know what other non-canvas things um I've painted on and that sort of the biggest thing is ceramics um especially when I was sort of starting out with ceramics um, I ended up taking it somewhat by accident because a painting class didn't fit in my schedule. Um, and so my approach to ceramics was very much trying to use the clay as a canvas. Um, and so that's probably the thing that I have the most practice painting on, um, other than eggs and canvas and paper. Um, but I'm always interested in like trying rocks and different things like that. Um, and would love to try other things. Any other questions? Yeah, what is the most difficult animal? You've seen eggs. What is the most difficult animal at this Millbrook Zoo you have painted or carved? Lucy wants to know what the most difficult animal to paint or carve is. Um, that's a hard one. Um, I always find that carving some of the animals that have super detailed faces and sort of intricate features is really difficult. Um, so for example, getting the expressions quite right on the marmosets and tamarins is really hard in the emu egg format because there isn't as much of a room for nuance and color. Um, and they're probably some of the more difficult ones to paint as well, just sort of logistically because they have such detailed faces. Um, but I also personally um, probably find the wolves somewhat difficult too, um, just because I really want to get it right and they're a little bit hard to like get the expressions on their faces exactly right. Do we have any others? All right, I think that's it as far as questions go. So if you have enjoyed this episode, I'd like to remind you all that you can view all of our previous episodes of Live from the Trevor Zoo on our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com forward slash Trevor Zoo Millbrook. And you can watch our streaming cameras throughout the zoo 24 hours a day at www.millbrook.org forward slash Trevor Zoo Live. Thanks for spending part of your Wednesday with us. If you are in the area, please come visit us in person. It's easy to make a reservation at our website, which is www.trevorzoo.org. We are open every day. This is the final live episode of 2020, but we will see you again in 2021. We'll be back here live from the Trevor Zoo next month. Thanks for watching. Happy holidays to everyone. Merry Christmas and have a happy new year.